So ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Aon Insight series. This CFO session was voted one of our most popular last year in Melbourne, and we're delighted to introduce you to two of our special guests here today. In this next session, we're going to be joined by two of Australia's leading CFOs, Gillian Larkins from the Australian Securities Exchange and Laurie Tremaine from Origin Energy. With the title of this year's Aon Insight series being all about better decisions in a complex and volatile world, the day would not be complete without hearing the perspectives from two ex executives that spend most of their time trying to manage this dynamic for their respective organisations. So, Gillian, let's start with you. Um, welcome to the Aon Insight series and thank you for joining us. Can you briefly describe, Gillian, your role, your tenure with uh, the Australian Securities Exchange and a bit of your background and also, of course, give us a bit of background uh, on your organisation, please. Well, good morning, Jason, and thank you for the invite. A pleasure to be here. Uh, I am the CFO at the Australian Securities Exchange, or for some of you on the call, you are not very long. Fancy. Been here two years. Um, prior to that, very much a career as a CFO or an accountant. Started off as a graduate trainee, a CA environment, um, did many jobs. The last four jobs have been of a CFO flavour, a funds manager, um, bank, a local bank, also a global bank. So that's my background. Um, many of you will know who and what the ASX is. The Australian Securities Exchange, it offers listing services, trade execution, clearing and settlement. We're also starting to provide data, data information. Um, we really just help facilitate the offering of investment products um, to you know the large pool of superannuation funds which are here in Australia. Great, thank you, Gillian. Over to you now, Laurie. Um, if you could do the same and just give us a, a bit of background, please, on your role, your tenure with Origin Energy, and uh, and also some some background on the organisation itself, please, Laurie. Yeah, sure. Good morning, Jason, and good morning, everyone. Um, I've been uh, CFO at Origin for um, for just over three years. Um, prior to that, I was at Woodside Petroleum for for ten. Uh, the last six of those at CFO. And prior to that, I was 17 years at, um, at Alcoa in the aluminium, aluminium business. Um, and almost entirely through my career, been in finance uh, roles. My CFO role at, at Origin is pretty traditional. Um, covers you know, finance, treasury, investor relations, M&A, corporate strategy, procurement. And then perhaps a little strangely, I've also got cor corporate sustainability and corporate HSC. So it's a pretty, pretty broad uh, role. I had um, risk at, at one time, um, but um, that's moved on now, which is great. Um, Origin is an integrated um, energy company, um, and, and the, the integration part of that is pretty extensive. Um, we're a, um, a shareholder and the upstream operator in a, um, a coal seam gas to LNG uh, business in, in Queensland. Um, that supplies about 30% of, um, of East Coast um, gas supplies and also um, uh, supplies LNG to, to customers, particularly in China and, and Japan. Um, we generate electricity. Um, we retail electricity and, and gas to, um, to uh, households, um, but also businesses, um, uh, again, predominantly in the, in the East Coast. Um, Around about 25% of our um, total uh, electricity generated will um, will come from renewables uh, when this massive stockyard hill wind farm starts up um, later this uh, this calendar year. Um, and then finally, we we do a bunch of other things. We um, we install solar um, for people's homes, um, batteries, uh, and provide a whole range of other um, energy solutions. Back to you, Jason. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Laurie. And uh, so, as we can see, two diverse companies here. Um, obviously, financial services and uh, and energy, energy distribution, um, as well. So it's going to going to be a, a very, very fascinating conversation. So let's let's just start first and foremost, Gillian and Laurie, with COVID nineteen. And I'm I'm really interested to know um, how your organisations have dealt with the pandemic, and what impact it's had on your respective businesses. Also, as most businesses look to reshape their business plans and their strategies, I'd be really interested to know um, 
what your organisation's doing around that moving forward. So, Gillian, we might we might start with you on on COVID nineteen, please. Sure. So really the story for us at the ASX really started March the 13th when on the uh, stock exchange you would have seen a surge in volume, in trading volume, and it was definitely the highest amount of trades that we've ever done um, beyond the GFC uh, in any one day. So we had a surge in trades, we had a surge in market surveillance alert. So of course as companies were also hit by the experience of COVID, they of course had to um, give alerts to the market as to how they were proceeding. Um, we also had a surge in the number of bonds volume coming through. Um, and it probably also, we also saw the second largest quarter in the history of secondary capital raised as companies were actually shoring up uh, their own balance sheet. So really COVID was really quite monumental um, from an exchange perspective. Having said that, we had been, how do we deal with that? We fortuitously over the last two years have been going on quite a massive technology upgrade across the company and that was pushed uh, in March and thankfully it was fine. We didn't have any outage and it was all good. And that's very important to us as a utility, making sure that we're up at all times. But certainly since that surge has died down, certainly you go back, you recalibrate the spend we have on technology projects where we did spend making sure um, that we have that super time. So that would be number one. Um, number two was obviously around people. So once again, um, we actually moved 95% of our employees over one weekend in March uh, to work from home. Thankfully, because we had had the technology spend, um, people were able to get up fairly quickly, actually, in hindsight. Um, and really, we still have, I would say, probably over 80% of our employees still are working from home. So obviously, like every other company and every other entity at the moment, very important around mindset, reaching out to teams and just making sure they're super tight and well as we get through this. It's been a monumental Yeah, thanks, Julian. And it sounds like your business continuity plans kicked in really well um, at the start of the pandemic and was able to really respond. And you still got the vast majority of your workforce, Julian, um, working from home, which is interesting given the, the nature of the business. Yeah, I suppose um, being quite a heavily regulated entity, as is Laurie's, um, you know, you've got to have those uh, plans in place for when D-Day comes. And so, to be honest, yeah. we just went straight into that. Uh, it's something that we do, I think, as a living. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Julian. And Laurie, um, Origin Energy and COVID-19, the impact of the pandemic, can you give us an insight into how the organisations had to respond there? Yeah, firstly, the, um, the pandemic, obviously, um, is accompanied by uh, you know, something of an economic uh, crisis as well, and and it's had a fairly significant impact on on origin, and um, particularly in demand for for energy. So so demand is down uh, globally, um, as well as in in Australia. And so just give people a sense of that, um, electricity and gas volumes through the period. You know, the early period of the pandemic, say from March to June, was down you know, between five and ten percent. Um, so that's a big. Okay, looks like Laurie may have frozen there. So um, we might see if we can come back to Laurie in a few moments. Laurie, can you hear us? Okay, we'll just refresh, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll be back in one moment.
Okay, Gillian, can you hear me? I can okay. indeed. Okay, sorry, Gillian. It looks like we've lost Laurie. He's frozen for the moment, but that's okay. We'll just go. Uh, we'll just go to the next question. So hopefully, Laurie will come back very, very shortly. So um, the next question we had here was uh, was actually around um, just really the the nature of the business and dealing with all of I guess the stresses of being a CFO, Gillian, with financial reporting, people management, relations, IT. Can you tell us what's the main issue that's really occupying the majority of your time at the moment, Gillian? It's actually quite funny because I think, um, as per Laurie's experience too, you know, we've both been CFOs for a while and really you're very used to problem solving, you're very used to turning your head from one procurement issue to an IR issue to the financial reporting issue. But I think the thing that's been so pervasive COVID actually hit would just be to shore up projects and I think as a CFO right now, if there was investments in, you know, whether it's short term, medium term, long term, the reassessment in light of COVID as to whether you're spending your money in the right area, there's certain things yep. that came up in COVID that you now need to address. Um, I would add that that's probably the predominant focus at the moment. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. Just primarily focused on, uh, on obviously, cash flow and uh, those sorts of concerns and, and, uh, and yeah. those priorities as well. Well, we had a little bit of an ironic situation, different to Laurie, actually, in that the ASIC, you know, volumes were high. So so actually, from a cash flow perspective, that meant we were OK. But what that means is that will come right off into next year, which means so I had more, I have more of a medium term focus about what does this mean for 2021, as opposed to what it meant in March or April. Yeah. I understand, absolutely. And Julian, um, with your role, you're obviously very uh, very focused on risk management at the Australian Securities Exchange. How important is risk management to, uh, to the Australian Securities Exchange? And do you go through a, a regular enterprise-wide risk management process to really practice the discipline of risk management in a structured way? Sure. Um, risk management is so important uh, for any entity working in the financial institution space at the moment. I mean, it was before, but even increasingly, I think, over the last two years. Um, very important. Yes, we do have an enterprise. I just go back. Again, this year was so neat. I think very much so now management and leadership are very clear that they have to expect the unexpected. And as much as you might have had those plans and rolled them out each year and might have twisted around the top risk or the second risk and moved them, I think now you're going, well, hold on. What might actually happen if this was to happen, if an election was to happen, whatever, have we actually got things right where we can manage that? So I think even more importantly now, that annual enterprise risk is pretty important. How we do it here, Obviously, we're quite regulated, so we have two regulators. We have the RBA and we also have ASIC. So they review our plans each year to make sure we're you know, tight on that front. Certainly, we start from the ground up. We have our teams um, that uh, have discussion with the risk area. So line two, line one, looking to line two. Um, then that's brought together uh, with executives to a pine on. And then that's obviously taken through to the board. Heavy debate right through. You know, you always find that the front end of the business guys have a different percent of risk to what necessarily the finance team might have or the risk team might have. Um, but it's always a robust conversation. And I think it's incredibly important right now with the year that we've just had. Yes, yeah, absolutely, Julian. Um, and from a regulatory risk perspective, Julian, obviously uh, in the industry that you're in, um, we've already heard some uh, alternative views on regulatory risk during the Inside Series today. What are some of the key regulatory and, and, le and legislative risks that are really keeping you and your executives focused at the moment? Would you be able to share some of those? Yeah, I think we're a little bit unique in that in some ways we are a regulator too, even though we've been reg we are also regulated. So it's a little bit different. I think for us, what was more important to us is integrity of our settings. So what will keep us at night, up at night would be uptime, technology because we are utility for the rest of the market. So the thing that would keep us up at night would actually be uptime um, and we're regulated for that, right? And the next bit would actually just be making sure that integrity of our product offerings are sound, uh, very transparent products, 
um, making sure that that is right, the right settings. So to be honest, that's probably what more takes up people's mind than actually any confronting new re regulation coming through. Having said that, yeah, as I CFO, if I, go, if I go into my role, of course, we're always worried about new accounting standards and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, that's just part of the job. So I think they always come through and you just have to work out how to plan for them. Yeah, absolutely, Gillian. And you mentioned uh, in your introduction technology risk, Gillian, and the significance of technology risk at the Australian Securities Exchange. Actually, I see we've got Laurie back there. Laurie, can you hear me? I can. I have no idea what ah. happened. <laughs> OK, no worries. Well, you're back, Laurie, which is great. So we've just continued the discussion and we'll come back to you with a few questions in a few moments, Laurie. So... So it's great we've got you back online. Thank, thanks, uh, thanks for, thanks I'm for a, hanging I'm on a bit there. Dull. I'm, I'm a bit dull by myself, Laurie. We need you back. <laughs> That's <laughs> not true at all, Gillian. That's not true at all. I was enjoying our conversation. We're just talking about technology risk, uh, Laurie, and I, I've just asked Gillian the question on technology risk. You mentioned it earlier in the introduction, Gillian. Um, how, how much time as a CFO are you dedicating to technology risk, and how quickly is this shifting? Uh, in what the Australian securities uh, industry is doing. Um, and then I'd also like to also touch on cyber risk as well, Gillian, and your area of focus in that area too, if I may. Okay, well, I think as it's so much part of the being of ASX, I mean, we are a utility which uses technology as its enabler, it's as simple as that. It would take up probably over 50% of our discussions at the Exco table because we really just are that, you know, technology offering. Um, so because of that, I think in my role, obviously, I work alongside the CIO and the CRO, and um, our cyber team sits under the CIO. But having said that, certainly in our conversations, you know, it would be nearly on a weekly basis that this conversation would come up. So it's very important we have a really good, solid cyber risk team um, because of all the actions that are occurring across the world, so that's very important. It's very important we have the right funding model for that. Um, you know, as I said before, it's so important that we are, we do have uptime and we're not impacted. So um, it's already important. Um, and to be honest, all executives need to be pretty converse on that. Yeah, thanks, Julian. Laurie, just on back, back to Origin Energy on technology risk as well. How much time is, is Origin dedicating on technology risk and, and how quickly is that shifting in your industry, Laurie? Oh, sorry, Laurie, I think you might be on mute. Oh, dear, I'm, 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 I'm kicking goals <laughs> today. <laughs> no worries. Um, no yeah, look, we are, um, as a company, we've been quite worried about um, uh, disruption uh, of our industry. And so, as you can imagine, um, you know, there's a potential for a company to come along, a competitor to come along with a um, with some smart algorithms and, and maybe a, a, an app that differentiates them and to uh, to start competing in our market um, without investing in assets like we've done and and without investing in people and so um to, to given that risk we've um we've spent a lot of time uh, over a number of years um scouring the world for you know who are the disruptors um what's what approach are they using uh and to, to position ourselves so that we can disrupt uh, our own business and we did that um, initially through focus on uh, digitizing our interactions with our with our customers. And um, but more recently, um, we think we found uh, an effective disruptor in, in energy. We found them in the UK, a, a company called Octopus Energy. And um, ultimately, we've decided to um, to adopt uh, and license their platform. Um, but as we got to know them, um, we, we formed a view that, you know, we like this company so much that we would invest in them. So we've, we've taken an equity uh, position in their company and we're now in the, in the midst of, um, of implementing their software, which we think will do for us what it's done for them, which is give us a, um, you know, a clear point of differentiation in our market in terms of cost to serve um, and also in, in terms of customer experience and and so um, if you look at them in the UK, they're 40% um, lower cost to serve than their next best competitor, you know, which you, you'd understand is outstanding. 
and and it's largely based on it's based on two things: the, the technology that they've um, developed, um, but also the the operating model, you know, the business model that um, that comes along with that um, with that technology. So um, so you know, we hope to bring bring that capability to to Australia and as as a um, as a, a, a weapon in our defence to uh, to disruption. Yeah, absolutely. So really looking at those emerging companies that have that technology and trying to move as early as you can, Laurie, to adopt that technology, which is uh, which is obviously uh, right. obviously the way, the way to go. L Laurie, when um, when you were off the line, I was just talking to um, I was just talking to Gillian about the stresses of uh, of being a CFO actually, and um, the question I, I was asking Gillian was around the fact that. On a daily basis, you must be dealing with a range of issues, you know, financial reporting, people management, tax, investor relations, IT. What's the main issue occupying the majority of your time at the moment, Laurie? Yeah, I think um, that, that's a pretty tough question because um, I think um, I think executives today, I, mean, I think one of the core skills of an executive is the ability to handle multiple uh, tasks at, at once. I, I think... Um, uh, you know, I just don't have the I don't have the luxury of one priority. Um, but I think if there was, if I had to call out one, I would say, um, you know, our our industries, uh, particularly the um, the the downstream energy business, um, is a is a tough one. Um, but it is in it is in transition, and it's a transition that everyone on the call would probably recognise. Obviously, we're shifting from from coal. Um, to predominantly renewables um, firmed by by gas and batteries, and so for us the the, the challenge is how do we manage that um, how do we manage that transition? Um, how do we allocate our capital and and still generate a, a decent return on that capital? Um, and then how do we take um, employees uh, and um, and other stakeholders like investors along for the ride with us? So, it's, so if you like, my answer is um, it's sort of a strategic one, but also linking it back to um, to the to the typical um, stakeholders that that CFOs have to work with. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Laurie, you're probably now focusing on tasks that, I guess, in earlier stages of your career, you were focused on the core sort of financial uh, management tasks and disciplines. But I guess now, as you say, it's becoming far more strategic as a CFO focusing on these other areas. So fascinating to hear where your time is, is being spent. Laurie, just another final question before we go back to Gillian. Um, I asked Gillian a question on regulatory risk in her sector. Obviously, regulatory risk um, and legislative change, obviously significant in your sector as well. Can you give us an insight into, uh, into those sorts of risks um, and, and the sorts of issues that are keeping you and your executives at your organisation busy? Yeah, I think Gillian called it at the uh, in her opening remarks that um, that the we like the ASX are um, are heavily um, regulated um, uh, industries, and um, so you know I'd like I, there's not many issues that keep me awake at night, um, and uh, despite uh, the extent of government intervention in our business, um, however. Um, I think um, yeah, we all all would have read uh, in the media in, in recent weeks the, the government's um, intention to to start investing uh, in in energy, but um, particularly um, uh, talking about generation. So so obviously they're investing just now in um, in Snowy 2.0, uh, and more recently they talked about investing in a uh, thousand megawatts of um, of gas generation capacity. Um, and so, whilst governments are intervening in that way, and, and they they invoke a um, a catch twenty uh, two type predicament for us by saying, well, if um, if the industry and, and and private businesses don't invest, then then governments will step in. Of course, we're left with the uncertainty of um, of, of just how much um, governments will intervene, and it's not just the federal government. We're dealing with interventions in state governments as well. And so with that uncertainty, it, it in turn makes it very, very difficult for us to invest. And so, um, so I think that's probably the most significant issue today. Of, and again, I'll um, uh, remind you of the comments I made earlier about um, us being an, an industry in transition. 
the transition requires investment and today there's, there's significant uncertainty and therefore difficult for us to invest. So that's probably the, you know, that catch-22 situation is probably the, the toughest question we face right now. Yeah, absolutely, Laurie. No, thank you for sharing those uh, those insights. Um, Gillian, back to you. Uh, and I, I want to sort of shift the discussion now and move over to talent. Um, as a matter of interest, I think a lot of the audience will be interested in this from a CFO's perspective is how involved do you get in the selection, recruitment and retention of talent in your organisation? And how much time do you invest in helping to make the right decisions around talent that goes into the Australian Securities Exchange? It takes a lot of time. Um, I mean, I think this year has been a little bit different in that everyone seems to be staying put at the moment. So I think prior to this year, um, certainly from a senior perspective, all senior executives certainly get involved and anyone that's appointed from GM and up. Incredibly important to have diversity of thought, incredibly important um, to pick people who have enthusiasm, to walk the talk, uh, and just have a really credible resume. Um, you know, we, we are offering, it has to be, you know, what I want to say, very much open, intuitive management style of something they're looking for now in leaders. Um, obviously, um, in my own team, probably right down to um, right down all the layers, I'm very keen on how we manage talent. Um, very much along the lines that people do talk about a lot about the prevalence of data analytics now, not necessarily just accounting and spreadsheets and debits and credits. You really yes. are looking for um, a skill set where, whereby people are using analytics, um, whether it be from a time perspective um, or whether it just be because that's the way the world's going and we have to keep ourselves contemporary. So that really is the sort of skill set that you're looking for in your own team. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned um, diversity, equity and inclusion, Gillian. Obviously, this is uh, really significant now for for all organisations moving forward. How focused is your um, company at, at getting that balance right and, and, and really making sure that a balanced a balanced decision is made around uh, around hiring from a diversity, equity and inclusion perspective? Um, I think like most companies, you know, there certainly is a percentage that we would like to see from a female male perspective. And the ASX is very close to that from a management perspective and also executive and board. Um, but there's more that people can do, and diversity is not just about the female-male um, side of things. It's actually more about diversity, diversity of time, and there's just so much work that we need to do, I think, as a community. So you just plough on and continue yeah, doing no. what you do. Uh, great feedback. Thank you, Julian. And Laurie, any uh, any perspectives from uh, from Origin Energy in relation to talent? How how involved do you get in the recruitment selection of the right talent into your team, but in, into the more broader team as well? Are, are you involved in, in in making those appointments in other parts of the business for senior executives? Yeah, in um, in my part of the company, um, we use a you know an unusual tool. I, I would say um, I, haven't, I haven't seen it in too many other companies, but it's a, a concept of a skill pool. And so um, I take um, responsibility for for people throughout the company who have a a finance, economic, or commercial background, and we we try and manage that that group of people as a pool to enable um, better uh, career development for those people and the opportunity to move around, you know, to, to generate velocity in people's careers. Um, what the what the skill pool requires us to do is um, is to make sure we understand people pretty well, so we know what their aspirations are, we know what their experiences are to date, and then together with them develop a you know realistic plan about next steps and 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 future pathways. So um, so there's a, a relatively small group of leaders who who um, take carriage of that skill pool. And uh, and then they um, they make moves happen. So um, so either when opportunities become available, they'll they'll find the right people to move into those roles. And in some cases, they create opportunities by by creating a series of moves to uh, to again get get that velocity into people's careers. It's pretty um, early days for us doing that at, at Origin. Um, and it's predominantly happening in that that finance um, commercial kind of space. 
um, but it's um, it's my goal to uh, to have that move into other to other skill pool groups um, at Origin, and it, so it seems to be um, to getting some momentum, which I think is good. Yeah, great to hear, and really good to hear the perspectives from you and Gillian on on your focus on talent retention. It's 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 really good to hear that feedback. Um, Laurie, let's uh, just change over to the topic of data and analytics. Um, how, uh, how are you utilising data and analytics uh, within Origin and what benefits is it providing to you and also to the end client? Um, do you have a true digital strategy and how important is this to the future of Origin's business, Laurie? Yeah, I'll start with the di digital strategy first. And I, I mentioned it earlier that... Um, that through the pandemic, um, we've seen a big step up in, in terms of uh, customers interacting with us on, online. Um, uh, this has been a, you know, an ongoing strategy for a number of years, but, but it, there's just been an acceleration of take up in, in recent times. Um, we, have, uh, we have a very good app. If anyone would like to uh, get on board with Origin and try the app, we'd, I'd, I'd really appreciate that. Um, so we have a good app. Um, what we've found, though, is people were using digital channels to deal with um, issues, but not really to um, to sign up uh, with Origin. So, um, and and the you know it's a it, an order of magnitude difference between the cost of onboarding a, a new customer through a digital channel versus other channels. So, um, so think of it as um, ten dollars to onboard um, through dig digital. Um, maybe fifty dollars if it's through um, through a phone call, and maybe one hundred and fifty, two hundred dollars if we use a um, a third party uh, channel. So um, there's a huge incentive for us to get our customers over to digital. But interestingly, um, the feedback from people who get online is that they um, they're more likely to deal with their um, with their inquiry. Um, first time and in a in a way that's satisfactory to them uh, through that digital channel. So it it, it works from us from a customer experience um, perspective as well. Um, dealing with the rest of your question, um, we um, we have a huge amount of data um, on on our customers and their usage patterns and all and all of that. And so we have an opportunity to, um, of course, with um, with our customers' permission. To find ways to to monetize that data, um, uh, to, and, and particularly to the benefit of our of our customers, and so um, right at the moment we've um, we've just launched a um, a new product, which um, which will enable set, enables us to send a, a text message to a customer that offers a reward if that customer um, switches off their air conditioning, if they or or their washing machine. So if they can make a right. A significant difference to their energy usage um, from a, a benchmark level of usage, then we'll provide them with a reward that, that they can then spend later in a, in a variety of ways. Um, we've just launched that product. It, it, obviously, it's using the data that we have available to us and the connectivity that we have with our customers these days. Um, the, the, take off, the take up has been phenomenal <laughs> so far. So. Um, so we've we have thousands of customers in just a couple of weeks, uh, and um, and more particularly the when we've when we send the text messages, the proportion of customers that are um, having a go uh, has been quite high as well. So wow. um, so far it's been a real success in how we're using data differently to to provide um, you know additional services rather than just selling an electron or selling a molecule of gas. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like that's really going to enhance the customer experience as well, Laurie, and probably build some retention into your client base as well, which is fantastic. Yeah, you, yeah, you picked it exactly right. So, um, so if um, if customers like our app, they're less likely to, to move. If they like this sort of gamification of energy, um, and they see that at, at Origin first, they're more likely to to stay. And again, the stickiness of customers is really important in the energy business. Yeah, I could imagine. Absolutely. Um, thanks for those insights on data and analytics, Laurie. Really, really helpful. Um, Gillian, I'm going to move to another topic now and one of culture. And I think a lot of people hear the word culture and sort of a bit of a sigh, you know, 
a culture. Oh yes, you, you know, let's have a let's have a talk about that. But um, culture obviously is critical um, moving out of the pandemic for any organisation. C- can you give us some insight, Gillian, into how you feel a CFO can influence the culture of an organisation? I think it's not necessarily a CFO, but I think a senior leader or a senior executive really needs to show up each day in the way that they want to see others as well. So if you're expecting others to be respectful and interested and whatever, you sort of kind of have to be the same. So I think, and increasingly, it's more difficult in COVID. If you as a leader were struggling with that before COVID, well, it's just doubled in emphasis um, with the majority of your team, if not all, sitting on the other side of the camera. So I think it's incredibly important as we're going through COVID just to to, to reset um, how uh, your team needs to be when we come out the other side. Well, how it has been, but actually how it's going to be coming out the other side because, as they say, life is not going to be normal anymore. And so the culture may change. Um, You want to keep the good, but maybe there are some positives that have come out of COVID where I know for me, um, I do coffee catch-ups with the juniors. I reach out to about three a week, making sure that they're okay, they're intact, they're doing some exercise, getting away from the Zoom calls. Um, they've yep. got enough work. You know, actually, there's another thing there. Maybe yeah. um, we're actually in the system and you're there day to day and you've been told what to do. For some of the juniors, it's actually quite tough. So yes. I think hopefully um, through COVID, we're evolving to a better culture where we're more aware of others. Yeah, absolutely. And you've touched on a great point there, Gillian. And uh, I think this, uh, this, I think, starts to dive into the concept of mental wellness during the pandemic as well. And just checking in and making sure people are OK. We've got a whole range of questions that have come in. Um, from a variety of sources, which I'm scanning as we're having the discussion. And, and I want to introduce the first question, if I may, um, Gillian, and then I'll throw to Laurie on this one, because I think it's really important. And that is, how have Origin and the Australian Securities Exchange gone above and beyond in dealing with employee wellbeing, particularly relating to the, the, the mitigation of the looming mental health crisis? So I think that's a, a really timely question. Gillian, how would, you, how would you address that answer to that question? Uh, we have set up a forum, a, probably a Be Well forum, um, whereby we have speakers, we have half-hour chats by the CEO every week reaching out. Uh, we have updates to employees about what's going on, not necessarily whether they're involved or not. They just know that they feel part of what is going on. Um, you know, bringing in motivational speakers. Uh, certainly we've had a lot of polling. And maybe the, I'm not sure the polling is good or bad, but certainly we're just keeping a pulse check on yep. teams and their promotion, um, just really making sure that we keep in contact with each of them. So we've got a series of initiatives at the moment until we get back Great in the feed- office. Great feedback, Julian. Thank you. And Laurie, what about yourself at, at Origin? How are you trying to deal with this focus on mental health during the pandemic and you know, isolation, working from home, those sorts of challenges? Yeah, quite similar to um, to Gillian's comments. Um, we we've changed our mode of operation. So obviously we're all working at home. So we've stepped up the um, the daily uh, contacts, and and we're much more likely to um, to reach out to to each other, check that we're that we're okay. Um, so that's you know that's been in place um, since the very beginning. I think so. We we respond to that quite well. Um, Again, like the ASX, we've um, we've had a, a program of um, of speakers coming in to talk to us about um, about health and well-being, but particularly mental health. Um, it's been really successful. We've had some great great speakers. Um, obviously, that includes a Q and A section, and and to be honest, some of the Q and A has been quite uh, disarming, um, and so people have um, have have shared a lot. And it became quite clear that there were people who were struggling uh, in the in the environment, and not obviously everyone's situation was was different. But um, you know, by by way of example only, um, you know, people who are, are working parents and are now homeschooling and all that sort of stuff, they put a lot of pressure on people. Um, and then we've also built up a um, what we call a, a well was it a wellness and no health and wellbeing hub, um, which is a um, uh, you know, a, a source of resource that sits on our internet 
that people can refer to um, and, and along with that is all the normal um, support that they can get from from the company and, and our, our outsource providers so so um, you know I, I'm quite pleased um, so I, as I said at the outset the HSE the corporate HSE team reports to me so um, yeah. I've been quite yeah. pleased with um, how proactive they've been and, and so I think I think they've done a great job. Yeah, that's great to hear, Laurie. Um, here's a good question, because we obviously have a, a lot of risk managers in the audience uh, today. And the question here, and I'll, I'll pass this back to you, Gillian, and then pass back over to Laurie. What are the key things that you're looking for right now from the risk managers that work in your business in the current environment? What are the things you're looking for from your risk managers? Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I think that... Um... So it's quite, we have risk champions in each of the business units, which are obviously your first line risk champions, of which then, you know, line two is risk. And I think right now it really would be observations and being ahead of the game when you see trends. We're very much into trends here and correlations and things like that. And just seeing if there's a trend or something that's a little bit swift, uh, that should be something that should be notified straight away. So I think timeliness. Um, and really just looking for those trends are probably most important right now. Yeah, great feedback. Thanks, Julian. Laurie, what about yourself? What are you looking for with your risk managers at the front line? Yeah, obviously our businesses include people who um, produce gas, people who, um, who produce uh, electricity, and um, you know, even someone who's on a roof um, fitting on a, a solar panel. So they're inherently um, risky activities. And so, um, so what we what we ask of all of our people every day, not just the risk um, people, is just pay attention. You know, be alert. Um, uh, take the uh, f you know follow our processes and follow the normal procedures of um, of thinking before you you act. Um, so, you know, when obviously in unusual times like the times we've faced, it's much more likely people are going to become distracted. And so that, um, you know, we've, we, the other thing that we've done <laughs> through this period is we've had a mindfulness uh, program. And so, yeah. um, so we've alerted people to um, the need to remain mindful while you're on the job, particularly when there's so much going on in the world around us. Yeah, absolutely. Great feedback. Thank you. And um, here's a really good question that's come in on the changing landscape of risk. And earlier today, uh, Aon CEO Greg Case um, made some comments about our future combination with Willis Towers Watson and really the fact that that was driven around trying to innovate more, in fact, on behalf of our clients to explore greater levels of innovation. Um, do you feel that there's a gap in the innovation in gender in the insurance industry, Laurie? And, and what's your expectation of advisors or brokers around this, this innovation agenda perceived gap? Do you have a view on that? I'm not sure that I do have a view actually on innovation in the insurance industry. Um, look, I, I, I've actually uh, found the industry to be quite a tough one to uh, to deal with, uh, particularly over the last couple of years. Um, and so, um, so I, I think some things have to change. Um, so you know, we're we're constantly looking at our insurance program and um, and and making changes. To, to manage the cost outcome, uh, to be honest, and so in, innovation from from the uh, the supplier in this case um, could help because um, left to our own devices, we'll we'll withdraw uh, aspects of our, our insurance from the market because we have no choice, and so um, so the market's currently driving some you know sharpening of the pencil around. You know what really are our risks? What is our risk tolerance? And therefore, you know what therefore are we going to insure going forward? So, um, so not exactly answering your question, but um, but but I guess it's a valid uh, customer or client perspective that we're finding it a very tough environment. Oh, absolutely, Laurie, and thank you, thank you for your perspective there. And Julian, any any comments from your yeah. end? Obviously, experiencing a similar. Uh, a similar phenomenon Absolutely. at the moment. I was, I was nodding away with Laurie and I thought he answered very diplomatically. Yeah. I think um, 
But if I could put my hat on for small companies, actually, and so what we've seen, obviously, we're the home for IPOs here in Australia, and I, I'm, I'm quite troubled by small startups and small companies and whatever, and what they have to steer into from an insurance perspective that's becoming incredibly costly uh, for most entities. It's not just ASC, um, you know, alone. And so if we're talking about innovation in the in market, great to be thinking through you know, from a patchwork perspective, that's what Aon does really well. You know, rather than just a straight line and how we insure and whatever, is there a different way that you can look at it from a startup to a fintech to an IPO newly launched to someone who's been around for a while, which is us? Um, is there a different way that you can look at this? Because it's actually becoming a little bit cost preclusive. And Laurie is right. If you end up making decisions that you have to risk accept, but it may not be ideal for either the company or the insurer. So surely there's a middle ground whereby we can think of things a little bit more uniquely. And I think Aon's very well placed to do that with your patchwork process. Yeah, and no, I thank you, Julian. Great perspective there as well. Thank you. Um, I've only got time for one more question for each of you, and I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, and that is, when you look back on 2020, what do you think would have been one of the major learnings for you as a CFO, but in fact as a, a senior leader in Australia? And we'll start with you, Laurie. Yeah, um, we were we were taken by surprise by the um, the speed at which we um, we handled the you know the initial uh, issues created by the pandemic. And so, for example, our, our call centre, which relies on um, computer-based um, telephony. Um, we're able to move them within three weeks to working from home. Um, I don't know how long that would have taken uh, in a business as usual kind of environment, but I'm, it would have been a lot longer than three weeks. So what's the lesson from that? So we, we found a way to be more agile, to make decisions more quickly. So um, so what's the lessons? What what stops us from doing that normally? You know, is it some form of bureaucracy? You know, what is it? And so, um, so let's uh, let's uh, um, let, let's become more agile and and treat these sorts of questions and issues as as if it's a crisis and and just move more quickly. We've started yes. doing that. You know, the, the the product that I talked about before is a really good example. So we're measuring, you know, time to uh, time from idea to product in the marketplace um, as a as a not. Not absolutely as a consequence of the pandemic, but but the pandemic sort of causes us to think about what what enabled us to move more quickly. Yeah, great feedback. Thank you, Laurie. And Julian, from your perspective, what one of the major learnings from 2020? What what would you say is one of those key learnings as a, a senior executive? Really easy for me. I think the pandemic was has been an instant leveler. And absolutely, as much as leaders for years have been saying we have emotional intelligence and we need to look out for people and we need to think about flexibility, it made that happen. We had to shift to that within three or four weeks. Um, and I think that has been the most telling thing over 2020. And I so hope that when we all do go back and the pandemic will decide that we can still uh, live that way. I think relationships yeah. are more important than anything. Yeah, great, uh, great perspective there as well, Julian. Thank you. Well, Julian and Laurie, um, thank you so much for joining our panel discussion today. I had all the cute questions, even more of them racked up, but we're not going to we're not going to have time to get through to all of those. But I've been I've, I've been able to ask you a few. Um, but we really did appreciate your uh, your insights into the mindset of a CFO and also senior leader, and how you're both successfully navigating these challenging times. Um, thank you again for your contribution today. What I thought was a terrific discussion, and I know the audience will benefit from it enormously. So, Gillian, Laurie, thank you so much for your contribution, and uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you at our Insight Series event next year. Thank you. Okay, there. Thank you.